I'm going to talk now about the new IPMO model for the 21st century. First of all, let us look at the definition of uh, IPM. Inter IPM is integrated pest management and it is defined by different people in different manners. But let us look at a, a, an authentic uh, definition from uh, University of uh, California. Uh, if you look at this, IPM is about an ecosystem-based strategy where you try to use biological control, habitat manipulation, uh, modification of cultural practices, and the use of resistant varieties and all those uh, options before using pesticides. And the use of pesticides depends uh, or, uh, when you monitor the pest populations and uh, when uh, that monitoring tells you that you should take a preventive uh, you, you, um, correction measure to reduce the suppress the pest populations to reduce the economic damage. But in as you can see in the bottom, um, IPM includes a variety of tactics and chemical control options are to be used only uh, when it is necessary. But in reality, chemical control seems to be everywhere and and as, as a primary uh, tool for controlling pests. And uh, you can um, use them to treat the seeds or transplants or throughout the uh, crop production cycle to control pests or diseases or weeds uh, that damage the uh, crops. So when we have a system like that, for the traditional IPM model, the uh, emphasis is on maintaining ecological balance and uh, making decisions based on um, when it is necessary to prevent losses. So it is both based on ecology and economics. But if, if you look at the theory, there is a heavy emphasis on ecology. You frequently hear that the, you need to uh, protect the environment, uh, protect the natural enemies, uh, pollinators, and uh, ma make sure that uh, whatever practice is uh, uh, followed is not affecting environmental and human health and so on. So you see a heavy emphasis on uh, the ecology. But when you look at the practical uh, aspect of IPM, there is a heavy emphasis on how much it costs. Uh, can I wait until the crop, uh, the pest populations reach that uh, threshold levels before I make a decision or take an action? Or can I afford to um, use a particular practice? It might work, but it may be more expensive than some of the other options I can consider. Or can I... Uh, do the crop rotation? Can I follow um, some some other practices, uh, cover crops, or using uh, alternative um, ways of attracting the pests uh, from the main crop to other, uh, these uh, trap crops and so on? So there are several strategies, but at the end of the day, uh, the cost of that operation and uh, the returns based on that particular decision determine um, whether a, an aggressive IPM approach can be followed or not. So the, the old model, uh, the one, the triangular version I showed earlier, it mainly focuses on the management aspect. You know, it, it is looking at various control options to suppress pest populations. And again, when we are talking about pest, it includes all kinds of uh, organisms that uh, damage crops. It can be arthropods or weeds or path pathogens or uh, nematodes and so on, uh, or other uh, invertebrate uh, pests. So when we are looking at uh, various control options or management options, you, we, we see, traditionally we see these uh, uh, host plant resistance, cultural control, biological control, behavioral control, uh, physical or mechanical control, microbial and chemical control options. Let us look at those individually. So host plant resistance is where you select these, uh, where you choose these uh, varieties that either tolerate or resist pest infestations or infections. And uh, they may also possess certain characters that make 
the plant less attractive or mature earlier or produce higher yields so that they, they can compensate some losses and so on. Uh, using um, BT, um, BT cotton or BT soybean or BT uh, um, corn are some of uh, the examples of successful examples of using host plant resistance. Uh, here, BT means Bacillus thuringiensis, a, a, a toxic gene from this bacterium is inserted into the plant. So it, uh, the plant produces this uh, uh, toxin. So when an insect feeds on these plants, they die. And the, such kind of host plant resistant mechanism can save the grower from applying um, pesticides or taking other control uh, measures. Then cultural control is uh, actually it is very uh, productive um, because it can be done way before, right from the beginning uh, throughout the production season, even before the pest uh, can occur in the field. So adjusting the planting dates, either you plant a little early or a little late, so you are avoiding a vulnerable stage of the crop uh, from coinciding with the a pest or disease uh, um, in, in incidence. Then you can also modify the irrigation or nutrient management practices because you know sometimes increasing the moisture or humidity or uh, adding water to the uh, ecosystem can reduce uh, certain pests and sometimes excessive irrigation can contribute to some disease problems. Uh, similarly, excessive application of nitrogen fertilizers can make the plants more attractive to some pests and diseases because they change the uh, physiology, they increase the uh, carbohydrate content and reduce the uh, defensive chemicals in the plant so they could make the plants more attractive to mites and uh, sometimes some diseases too. Uh, in the same way, applying calcium and silicon uh, make the plant tissue stronger and help uh, the plants to withstand um, both biotic and abiotic uh, uh, pressures. And then uh, there are several other cultural uh, control options that we have using these uh, trap crops uh, where you can plant these uh, uh, alternative hosts near uh, the main crop so that the pest is more attracted to to, towards these uh, trap crops and again rotating the crop it, it is again a, a huge uh, uh, it, it will have a huge impact when the pest populations of the propagules of a fungus or bacterium are in the soil uh, when you rotate the main crop with a non-host plant uh, for the next season, these pest populations decline. So you can use this uh, uh, depending on the pest and the crop. And then again, removing uh, infested or infected plant material and keeping things clean in the plant. So as you can see, there are so many cultural practices that uh, reduce the pest incidence or reduce the losses due to the pests, even before we can uh, um, try to use other options. Then biological control is uh, has been very popular. Um, if it is an invasive pest, a classical biological control is used where you go to the uh, native area of the pest and look for suitable um, natural enemies, whether they are uh, predatory arthropods or uh, parasitoids, which are uh, these uh, tiny wasps that uh, deposit eggs in the host insect. And then uh, they, they provide control. So you can bring them, um, you know, multiply and release them for the area-wide control. Uh, or augmentative control is where you periodically release uh, these natural enemies. And um, so there are these ways of uh, classical or augmentative biocontrol. And uh, additionally, we can also conserve, take various uh, uh, practices um, or adopt various practices that conserve naturally occurring um, these uh, predators and uh, parasitoids. And then the behavior behavioral control is about uh, using, uh, manipulating the behavior of the insect or uh, taking advantage of their behavioral preferences where you uh, provide an attractant or a repellent or use uh, certain things so that uh, these uh, arthropods are attracted to and get trapped. So, you know, baits and traps are some examples and also very popular is uh, the practice of mate mating disruption. 
So you uh, you use pheromones to confuse these uh, insects, and uh, as a result of that, they they um, they are not able to mate and produce the offspring. Uh, and this practice is very uh, successfully used in uh, controlling several uh, lift up turn pests. Then physical and mechanical control is using various uh, physical structures, whether it is uh, uh, providing screens to uh, a greenhouse or, um, or row covers in a field, uh, using these uh, kind of various uh, options to um, basically exclude uh, uh, the pest population. And then uh, you can also use vacuums so that they can be uh, carried or they can be mounted on tractors and then using these vacuums to aspirate uh, pests. And then microbial control is also uh, has been there for a long time uh, where entomopathogens such as fungi, viruses, bacteria, and nematodes, so these are um, used to attack various arthropods and then we also know there are several fungus and bacteria based uh, fungicides that have been successfully used especially in the recent past and then we also have certain fungi that attack uh, nematodes so there are all, uh, several microbial control options uh, in addition to the ones that uh, we can um, purchase and apply, there are several uh, entomopathogens that naturally occur and provide some control uh, under natural environmental, uh, natural conditions. And uh, then we also have some products from these microbes. Uh, they do not have live organisms, but they, when they ferment these uh, microbes and they, they produce certain metabolites that are toxic to these uh, the various pests and uh, then we have the chemical control which is very popular and chemical control typically refers to synthetic uh, chemicals but I would like to include anything that is a, a chemical whether it is an, uh, of a natural origin or it is uh, artificially made uh, because uh, you know the plants have several chemicals and these uh, microbes also produce some metabolites so they could be uh, considered as chemicals compared to some other options I uh, explained here. So whether regardless of the origin of those chemicals you know the, um, there are several a wide variety of uh, these uh, chemical compounds we currently have for use in agriculture. So this is uh, a traditional model, IPM model, that encourages using all these options of host plant resistance, cultural control, and everything else before using chemical control options uh, based on monitoring. Uh, you know, regularly monitor the field and use one or more of these options when um, those the scouting tells you that you have to take an action. But in reality, it is not just uh, you know the management of uh, pests and just uh, using one or more options for to suppress pests um, because even though when you have all these options at the end of the day as i mentioned before uh, it is the cost that uh, has a major influence on what a group can uh, take to either for a short term control or a long term uh, control so because of this it is not just a IPM doesn't seem to be just uh, uh, having various uh, control options and their cost and uh, when to decide um, which option to use it has it is a lot more than that um, then that, that is why we need a new model to include all those uh, factors influencing that uh, the primary reason is agriculture is no longer just a simple way of producing uh, food or uh, it is no longer subsistence farming. It is a, a, an art and it is a very complex uh, science because it involves uh, the environment, plants, pathogens, arthropods, and again, interactions among all of them. And then those beneficial microbes in the soil or on the plant and then um, various uh, biological and uh, abiotic uh, factors influence uh, crop production. So it is a complex science involving several disciplines. And then we all know that it is uh, 
a global enterprise. So it is an art, science, and business. So a simple model of presenting various control options is, does not seem to be no longer uh, appropriate for integrated pest management. So because of that, I developed this uh, new model. Um, I actually put uh, the most of this model about eight, nine years ago, and I started giving a few talks uh, at uh, extension meetings and uh, only recently, just a couple of years ago, I um, you know, expanded a little more and uh, published this uh, new IQ model. So now I am going to go over various components and explain uh, this new model. So in this IPM new model, we primarily have three uh, aspects, the management aspect, the business aspect, and the environmental aspect. And within the management aspect, we have four components. Uh, the first one is pest management. The second one is knowledge and resources. The third one is planning and organization. And the final one is communication. I have already explained the pest management part with the you know, various control options and the why and where we have to use them. And the next part is knowledge and resources. When we are trying to control a pest, again, it, it could be a weed or it could be a parasitic nematode or an arthropod pest or a pathogen, we need to understand it thoroughly. What is its life cycle? which stage is more damaging to the crop, or which stage is actually vulnerable for uh, a particular control option. And if you are talking about an arthropod pest, we, can, we have to look at is that, is that a, a, a boring insect or is it a uh, leaf feeder or does it feed on uh, roots? So, and is it uh, the adult and immature stages that are uh, harmful or is it only uh, nymphs or larvae, uh, you know, depending on which life stage is more damaging and where, what its habitat is, we may have different uh, control options. If it is a root feeder, contact for, contact insect sets uh, may not work that effectively unless, you know, you, you, get, you can get that uh, uh, particular material into the soil and where the pest is. And if, it, again, if it is a, a borer, uh, and uh, deep inside uh, the trunk or the stem or within the leaf folds, so then we may have to use a systemic insecticide so that we can uh, get the chemical or the whatever pesticide we are using to the target site. Uh, so, and again, if we have a soil insect, uh, soil, soil um, pest, we might be among various uh, entomopathogens. We might be able to use a particular one, depend, again, depending on where it feeds and which stage is vulnerable. And if we have uh, certain insects where the adults respond to these pheromones, uh, we could use uh, mating disruption. Or if it is a, an insect that is easily attracted to these uh, sticky traps or certain, you know, baits, we might be able, able to use that one. So we really need to understand all the control options that we have and which one is ideal for our particular situation and uh, when it is uh, uh, actually is more effective to control. And this again, this is not just for arthropod pests and we, we have to look at the diseases and if they have a, a resting spores in the soil uh, and uh, maybe we have to, uh, the best thing is to rotate the crop with a non-host plant and so on. So we need to have a thorough knowledge of the pest and various control options and again how each control works. We need to understand the mode of action of various chemical pesticides, various microbial control options, and in the same way, uh, which of, which uh, pest is more responsive to these pheromones. So that knowledge of a pest is very important in uh, um, integrated pest management. Then the next one is what kind of available options are there for a particular place or a particular crop. Uh, you know, it, it, not all options are available in all countries or all states, and maybe that a particular pesticide is available um, 
for example, we are in California, you know, it is available, may, but maybe not for the, this particular crop. So we need to look at even when we have all those options, we may or may not be able to use uh, all of them. So we have to look at what makes best sense and uh, whether I can afford that particular one. And then again, tools and technologies that might be required either to apply a particular pesticide or, or you know, it could be to release a, a predator mite uh, to control pest mites or maybe uh, releasing natural enemies. So uh, if, if we are releasing these uh, predatory mites, so let us take uh, strawberries as an example or grapes. Um, as an example, we, you know, we could be releasing uh, by hand and now we also have these uh, drones to release various natural enemies uh, so that they can be effectively uh, released on large areas in a short time. Uh, so we have to look at what kind of control options are there and can we go and release only when where there is a pest or do we have to release the entire field and uh, again if there, there might be certain uh, tactics that might require specific equipment uh, whether to apply a pesticide or, or to release something else that uh, helps reduce uh, the pest populations. So we need to be aware of all these uh, 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 available options and our affordability to use one or more of them. So that is about knowledge and resources. The next one is planning and organization. And uh, the first thing is we need to monitor. Uh, this is the most important uh, part of uh, integrated pest management, whether it is the new model or the old model, we need to regularly monitor whether we you know, physically go, as a, it is a manual monitoring or using these modern uh, drone technologies, uh, having this remote sensing um, for detecting stressed areas. It is not necessarily just for abiotic stresses, but you know, when, when the, new, the, the modern technology actually can, um, detect even certain pests uh, uh, if it is if it is a large pest uh, like uh, caterpillars sometimes the the drone imagery can actually detect and uh, see where these uh, caterpillars are and then th th that way we know uh, how severe the infestation or infection is in a field where it is and when we have to uh, take that particular action based on these uh, tools that we have and the next one is managing the information we gather about whether various control options or what can we do, uh, especially uh, the, the information that is collected and saved from year to year can be very useful. Uh, what happened when we had a big rain event? Did the did it kind of reduce certain pests, but also resulted in increased uh, uh, powdery mildew or uh, botrytis? Or uh, what what happened when we had extended periods of uh, you know heat, or maybe we had a mild winter? So we need to understand not just about the pests, how these environmental factors influence pest populations, but we also need to continuously think about plant growth and plant health and all the agronomic practices that we uh, take to maintain this uh, optimal growth and uh, increase the yields because they have a major impact. If something that we do increases the general health of the crop, maybe the plant can withstand pest populations maybe at, at 5% or more. So these, all that information and all and everything that we gather from within a year, from year to year, helps us to uh, manage and plan and decide what needs to be done. And then uh, taking the actions is very important. Uh, it could be uh, the various factors can influence the timeliness of these actions. Maybe there is a, a logistic problem or maybe there is a, a financial hurdle or there could be something else or other delays that prevent us from taking the right action. So we need to uh, look at this seriously. Like I said, it, agriculture is no longer a simple task. It is a very uh, huge task, a very complicated business and science. So we need to manage it, uh, pest management, uh, like a, a, just like a big business. So this is uh, about the planning and organization. And then the final component is uh, communication. 
communication is very important these days uh, to uh, you know to stay up to date about everything that is happening um, in in the uh, with these uh, whether it is the regulations or the new pests coming in and uh, any new uh, management options that we have for pest, pest suppressing these pests or forecasts and so on so we need to stay uh, informed about all these new developments and there are so many opportunities these days to learn the e events like this these outreach events like this or uh, podcasts or, or videos that are already pre-recorded and available online for everybody or uh, the university websites and the newsletters and trade journals and scientific journals we have so much information and then it is important for us to look at all these highlights and critical points of uh, um, crop production and crop protection so that we we manage all this information and develop a good strategy and then uh, communication within the group is also very important because when um, you know you know not everybody can go to all uh, to the all corners of the fields and look at what is happening so we need to communicate well so that the the, the field crew which are the eyes and ears uh, can report to other people and again the crop production team should also communicate with the crop protection team and then uh, it, the, the whole group has to communicate that a good community when there is a good communication system issues can be detected uh, quickly before it is too late and the appropriate decisions can be made and the next part is communication among growers um, you know we all know that there are certain things that are proprietary whether it is a, the fertility program or crop protection um, options or strategies sometimes it is not easy to um, or you know not everybody might be comfortable to share all that information but we need to realize that pests and diseases do not have boundaries they don't see uh, this field belongs to someone and that field belongs to someone else and i might stick here they 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 when certain uh, problems can become area-wide issues so we need to collectively work towards that you know while maintaining that uh, some uh, proprietary information but it is also important for everybody to work together it is not just the uh, growers but you know the growers and the educators and everybody has to work together to address certain issues and the next part is communication with the public um, this is something that the old model or many uh, people do not realize uh, is a part of integrated pest management, but it is very important. A lot of pests uh, can be a problem both in cultivated fields and in the backyards, and then you know, they can have a larger impact. And uh, similarly, uh, the consumers, public, um, you know, they, they, they everybody is a consumer because we all eat food that is produced and so we we as consumers we also have a huge impact on how um, food is produced so communicating with them telling uh, you know keeping them informed about whether it is the pests or the crop production issues and all that how uh, crops are produced what it means to using a pesticide or what does it mean um, to produce organically or conventionally or sustainably so it is important to educate public so that they make uh, appropriate choices that influence agriculture um, if we are talking about this spotted lantern fly which is a potential threat to grape industry um, public can play a significant role because it is even before it uh, gets to um, you know cultivated crops um, everybody might be uh, able to take a part in detect detecting and reporting and a pest like uh, the spotted lanternfly is also um, infesting landscape trees and uh, you know you know backyards or front yards so it is not just an agricultural issue uh, both public and the agricultural community uh, plays a critical role so communication among all of us is very important uh, so this is the management aspect of the new ipm model and at the core of this ipm is research and outreach whether it is the university researchers or the farming community 
or the ag input industry or other people. Uh, research is very important. Uh, research always does, a, does not mean conducting experiments. It is observation. We, we are observing and uh, realizing and uh, that certain things are happening according to certain things uh, in, in, in the sense of like a particular environment is causing this problem, a particular strategy is uh, resolving that issue. So all that is uh, research and building our knowledge and then we need to uh, disseminate to everybody um, that, that are a key players in this uh, pest management. And again, this could be uh, an agricultural pest problem or an environmental pest or urban pest issue. So we, this applies across uh, all um, disciplines and all places. And that is why developing information to research and uh, educating everybody involved in that in this process is uh, critical. And the next one is the management aspect. And here, we have the producer and the consumer and the seller. It could be a wholesale or retail uh, um, seller, but uh, you know we, we have these uh, three key uh, people involved in the business aspect of it. Maybe several decades ago, it is just the producer producing and selling it to the consumer. Uh, but and now it is. Uh, it, it appears, especially in the recent past, it is the sellers who are who have a bigger influence on what the producer produces and what the consumer consumes because of the marketing strategies and then uh, you know, and then the profits and all those other other um, financial reasons. Then they have a huge impact on who is uh, consuming what and how that particular. Uh, food is uh, produced. So this is also a, a big area and uh, you know I as a consumer I would like to decide what I want to buy and based on um, scientific knowledge uh, not because of uh, any fear or not because of uh, um, the false information but I want to produce uh, I want to consume what I think is safe for me and based on my choice I would like the producer to produce what uh, majority of the consumers are preferring. Then the retail market should sell based on what the producer and consumer decides, but that is not is uh, that's not what is happening now. So this whole equation of these uh, three entities is also very important in sustainable food production. And then the, the final part is this environmental and the social uh, part uh, where we are looking at the economic viability, environmental safety and uh, social acceptability. The, the important part of the economic viability here is for everybody. The producer has to make decent money. They have to make, make their operation farming profitable. And as a consumer, I want to be able to afford the food and, uh, you know, and feel that it is healthy and then a retailer should also make money Every, everybody should be happy that those who make profit profit and those who save uh, should be able to save so it is important for the economic viability especially for the farmer uh, when we have certain um, measures or certain approaches it can put a huge stress on the farming community and so th that is why that part is very critical in uh, IPM because IPM is not just about pest management. It is actually about the entire um, crop production system. It is a comprehensive approach, not just to control pests because economic practices also influence pests and everything is interrelated. So economic viability is very important so that the farming community can continue to produce healthy foods uh, for us at an affordable rate while they're making um, profits. Then environmental safety, it is very important. Nobody can deny that because we, anything that we produce, the farming practices should be, uh, um, should not be disrupting the environment. And it is not, we're not just talking about the pesticide use, but anything we do, whether the use of uh, 
excessive irrigation water or applying excessive fertilizers or using pesticides or doing anything we want to ensure the safety for the environment and um, it, it, for the soil soil microbial community and other organisms in the environment like the bds of fish and wildlife and, and and most importantly for the humans we want the farming to be safe for everybody so that is uh, uh, this environmental safety parties and then social acceptability. What is uh, this? We already have different uh, classes in the society because of various reasons. We all are aware of that. But do we really want another class of those who can afford a certain kind of food and those who cannot or those who can only afford this kind of food? So we don't want uh, a stratification in the society because of the way a particular food is produced or uh, only certain people can afford. So we want the food to be acceptable for everybody and nobody should feel that it is unsafe and that nobody should feel that uh, they cannot afford certain food because we, everybody needs to eat healthy and it is not just about eating a particular thing it is also it is going to have a huge impact on the healthcare system and uh, a country's uh, uh, economy because we want the healthy people healthy communities and a healthy uh, environment so as a result of this this new ipm model is not just looking at various pest management op options, but it uh, takes into account everything that is uh, influencing food production and um, the commerce associated with it. So this is the new IPM model and uh, its various uh, components. And this new IPM model primarily looks at economical, ec economic viability, environmental sustainability or safety and social acceptability. So these are uh, three uh, highlights of the new model where we are talking about, we call something an IPM, integrated pest management approach, when it is economically viable, environmentally sustainable and socially acceptable. So you can actually see uh, a f the, the full article at the um, Journal of Integrated Pest Management. It was published uh, in 2019, and you can uh, either um, scan this QR code here or use the link um, to access this um, full article. And then since it was published, it has been the most read article at the journal, and um, it had nearly uh, 17,000 views or downloads. And, uh, and, and I have been receiving positive feedback about this new model where educators and the farming community and everybody is realizing the importance of various parts of this new model and how they can use it either for teaching or redesigning their economic or pest management practices and improve the production. So a survey I conducted late, late last year and early this year um, actually showed a huge impact. Uh, this is a worldwide impact uh, with an estimated or uh, realizer savings of $34 million um, and applying this new IPM information or other IPM research or out, outreach I conduct uh, has been applied and would be applied on uh, this many 956,000 acres and with the potential uh, to reach 142,000 people. So this has been, um, this has been receiving um, very positive feedback from all over because it includes all aspects uh, that influence um, integrated pest management. After this, I am going to discuss a few more details that were not obvious in the model I presented but are very influential and also an integral part of this model. So those influencing elements are regulatory elements, commercial and social elements. 
the social part we already discussed a little bit and also the commercial aspect uh, but regulatory part uh, is all over the IPM our food production but we may not realize it so I want to go in detail about each of them so if you look at that when a pesticide or a fertilizer or any agricultural input uh, is it has to be registered you know it has to go through a scrutiny evaluation there are different agencies either federal or state agencies that decide where to put a particular ag agricultural input whether it is a, a pesticide or a soil amendment or a fertilizer or a biostimulant and so on so the regulation uh, regulatory element is very critical in registering these pesticides and that is where it actually ensures safety because they decide how much you use when you use and how um, how 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 it is used actually and uh, where it can be used which crops or uh, is it just before harvest or is it uh, several days or weeks before harvest you can apply so all these uh, regulations ensure safety um, so that when a, a, a produce is sold, we, we can feel safe that it does not have any harmful residue. And the same way, these, uh, uh, the residue levels and the restricted entry intervals and post-harvest, uh, pre-harvest interval and all the other um, guidelines govern using these various agricultural inputs uh, properly and then especially the education is also a part of the IPM as we uh, talked earlier and then here it is uh, those who are attending the outreach events or uh, obtaining continuing education credits there, there is a, a, a strict re uh, requirement for all these things what need to what can be used how it is used and how who can prescribe uh, which material and everything is regulated and that is why um, food produced in the United States and uh, is uh, very safe compared to some other places uh, because of mainly because of this uh, uh, strict regulations and there will be corrective actions if things are not done um, according to these guidelines and we, we have uh, local county agencies state and uh, federal agencies working together uh, working with everybody to ensure that the food produced is safe and then and, and because of that, this, uh, this regu regulatory element is all over. Um, when I ask uh, people for the feedback about this model and ask, is there anything that I did not cover, anything missing? A, a couple of people mentioned that, what about the uh, regulatory agencies and the, their role? And I did not put that as a separate circle or a separate item here because it is everywhere. You know, we, if you look at the pest management, it is heavily regulated. And then again, the knowledge and resources, when you use and how you use, and then the monitoring, it is required. And the same way, the communication, the uh, continuing education. So everything is regulated and wherever we have these strict regulations, uh, food is uh, food safety is fairly ensured and then the commercial element and as we talked earlier this is very important uh, how much it costs uh, for each um, control option and uh, how uh, whether, and what is the cost of the option and cost of implementation that is also very important if, if I can buy something but it requires a, a particular system to deliver that I may not have uh, those resources, and if it requires several people, or it uh, requires a, 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 a but uh, maybe it ha it can be released only by drones or something like that. So it is very important to consider the cost uh, of uh, these uh, options and their implementation. And then, what is the uh, what what happens at the end when we do that? Uh, uh, is there enough uh, enough profit uh, written on investment for the uh, grower uh, for using all these? This written on investment could be short term or it could be long term. And here I want to uh, emphasize something that some people might miss. You know, a particular strategy might look effective like a particular uh, pesticide might look effective, but if we keep using that insects or pathogens develop resistance, we all know about that. And very, very quickly that strategy or that option becomes ineffective. 
So in the short run, we might see that I am saving some money by using this, but any overuse. It is not just for uh, chemical pesticides. So it, it, with insects or pests develop resistance to any kind of uh, input, even for cultural practices. So it can be for chemical synthetic materials or bio pesticides uh, based on microbes. Um, you, you all know about uh, um, diamond back, diamond back moth resistance to Bt, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis based pesticides, and you also know about the uh, corn pests to Bt crops. So they resist the, the the genes inside the plants, or you know the chemical molecules we are applying. So it is very important to keep this long term um, efficacy, the cost uh, in mind. And it, it costs millions of dollars for pesticide companies to develop a, an active ingredient. And then again, to uh, go through the lengthy process of uh, uh, registration. And if we do not carefully use that pesticide, and if it immediately becomes or quickly becomes resistant, then we don't have options. So that is why integrated pest management encourages using all available options and it is not just their cost but the long-term impact uh, and especially on the environment so here the environmental cost is not just about what i mentioned now like what is the long-term impact on the environment but some strategies seem to be um, effective uh, or maybe they seem to be non-chemical or maybe they look like organic solutions or organically approved uh, options, but there could be a long-term impact on the environment. Uh, you know, certain fertilizers could be contaminating the groundwater because that uh, particular system only allows these. Uh, for example, if it is, if I have hydroponics or if I have a, a, a conventional farm and um, you can really fine tune your fertilizer inputs and make sure that it is only uh, present in the root system and uh, immediately available to the plant and you can manage how much the plant gets and uh, minimize uh, leaching into the groundwater. But it is not always possible with the other, uh, some of the natural uh, fertilizers. And similarly, um, I, I want to mention this, uh, you know, using bug vacuums for controlling ligus bug uh, in strawberries. Um, these are tractor mounted and compared to the pesticide application which you do once every week or every two weeks, um, these bug vacuums are uh, operated every day. So what is the environmental impact? I may not be using a pesticide but I am still using fossil fuels to run this. The same way using a mechanical harvester or using a herbicide or using people who drive several cars to get to a farm to remove weeds manually versus application of the pesticide, uh, a herbicide. So we need to look at all, all of those. It, it is not just uh, as in, uh, you know, black and white as uh, organic or conventional, but we need to look at the environmental cost of various practices. And then uh, again, the commercial element, uh, how much it costs for the producer and how much uh, the retailer is selling and how much the consumer is paying. And uh, this is also a, a big part. It is not just in uh, the commercial element of uh, this model, but it uh, spills into the social aspect too. So here we have this uh, commercial element. And the next one is the social one. Um, and it is a big one, uh, um, you know, as I mentioned, the important thing here is that affordability of food for everybody, uh, food, we all should be able to afford healthy food, uh, not everybody might be able to buy everything, but you know, the basic needs for the basic needs and basic uh, um, survival and good health, we should have food affordability. And if you look at uh, the conventional versus organic, you know, th th this is typically what we see. Conventional food is, uh, um, you know, cheaper and organic is uh, uh, expensive. Depending on the kind of uh, organic food, they, you know, the, it, it can be, uh, you know, very, very close to the conventional or it could be very expensive. But what we want is something like this. When you have a system 
not entirely relying on synthetic materials or you know what is perceived to be unhealthy um, we could you combine both uh, biological and all the, all the options like uh, you know uh, the synthetic and natural control options and it is also the synthetic fertilizers and natural uh, fertilizers or fertilizer supplements or amendments when we use everything in a balanced way the cost is optimized environment is maintained uh, environmental safety is maintained well and uh, you know the, the grower can make money the consumer can afford the food and retail retailers uh, can also uh, make money so when we have a system like that it is good both for the short term and long term benefits of the society and then the next part is the social part is food wastage here food might be wasted in the united states uh, various estimates uh, according to various estimates the food wastage is 150 to 170 billion dollars uh, according to a report a few years ago and it can i am sure that it is continuously increasing for various reasons and it is not just on the farm but even at the retail market or at the homes you know how much is produced and how much is actually sold and how much is discarded uh, <coughs> excuse me, at, at a grocery store and how much we buy and never consume and discard um, because of the spoilage. So if, if you look at the, the whole thing, it is that the consumer preference seems to have a huge impact on that. Uh, here we have these two pictures uh, of, you know, several oranges there and some damage like uh, from a, a disease damage here in a vegetable field. Um, but it, it, it if you don't see something like that left out in the field in certain countries, they collect everything, they consume everything. And I understand it is not possible to do that here because we have this strict consumer preference for perfectly shaped fruits and vegetables and they have to be packed uh, you know, perfectly. And uh, it could be because of the marketing purposes or the consumers always want unblemished fruits and vegetables. They they might be they don't mind eating insects if it is on a uh, if they are covered with chocolate or if they are uh, you know in a, in a candy but if they see an aphid on on a leaf uh, on lettuce or anywhere then we, we have a problem so the, these are the things that you know help consumers uh, understand how food is produced and the decisions they make uh, can have a significant influence on sustainable food production and here, it is almost like everything has to be of uniform size or a particular uh, clamshell or bag has to have a certain number of fruits or vegetables. This box has to have a certain number of, uh, uh, you know, uh, lettuce heads or broccoli or cauliflower and so on. So we are producing food like a, a manufactured uh, item. And that, that is also putting a lot of pressure and anything that is a little smaller, anything is that is bigger may not make it to the market. And that kind of wastage can be at the farm or you know, at, at various stages. So we want to uh, reduce that. When we can consume everything that is produced, imagine the profits and imagine how much uh, positive impact it can have. And the next thing is the consumer preference. Uh, again, like I mentioned earlier, it has to be uh, perfectly shaped and it has to look good. And if you look at the strawberries here, they, they are deformed because of possibly because of uh, the ligus bug feeding. Uh, they, they're ripe, they're red, and they're tasty, but because of their uh, slight deformity, they're not marketable. So when the fresh market strawberries are uh, harvested and sold and all these uh, um, deformed strawberries are discarded. And again, you can see the cherries here. Uh, you, a lot of times you have these uh, two cherries or the, there are these uh, projections and out, some kind of growth and they have a lower grade and then sometimes they're discarded and sometimes they're sold for a, a lesser price. But you know, we, we don't need to uh, be too particular about separating these and discarding perfectly consumable ones. And it, it, things like that, especially 
certain things that you are going to cut or cook and eat anyhow, it should not matter what kind of shape it has, unless it has a, a, a you know, fung fungal growth or maybe it has an insect inside, then we, we understand, but uh, you know, obvious uh, uh, damage that could uh, be a potential health risk. But if it is just based on the appearance and the shape or the size, then you know, we, we are putting heavy burden on uh, the growers. So this needs to be included as a part of IPM so that uh, good decisions are made by consumers. So, and then uh, the next part is the public education, not just about the way food is produced uh, in terms of the size and shape, but it, it is also about what it actually means to be organic, what is sustainable and is every chemical uh, dangerous? Does it mean that, you know, a lot of people, when you ask what, what do you understand about organic food, they, they, you know, the most common response is it is pesticide free. We know that it is not. And then again, having the chemophobia, uh, phobia. chemophobia is about having a fear of uh, these chemicals. Anything you think of a pesticide, then people are concerned about it. And there is a lot of false information uh, about various uh, agricultural inputs and uh, production systems. And if you Google organic or if you Google GMO or pesticides, this is what you see. It says that organic is good and the pesticides continue to kill. If, if pesticides do work, if, if this is true, like pesticides don't know when to stop, a lot of us don't have to work because you know you spray a pesticide and it takes care of everything. But we all know that it doesn't happen like that. And then again, lo looking at the GMO foods as a dangerous, uh, you know, we need to look at the whole thing uh, from a scientific perspective and a practical perspective and uh, educate everybody appropriately so that they make correct decisions. And when you, when we follow all these things. So that is why we have this uh, new system of uh, the new IPM model uh, when we can include all the aspects or all the factors that influence the food production. We can have uh, a, a, a system where everybody has confidence and it is, uh, you know, we, we can, it is not to uh, suggest a new label, but what I want to um, suggest here is that when we have an IPM based food production, we can uh, assure that it is safe for the environment, safe for the people, and it is profitable for the growers, and it is practical because it can feed uh, the growing world populations. I would like to thank you all for your attention. You can contact me um, through one or more of these uh, sources. And you can also see several of my presentations at the links I provided here and the scientific and or extension articles at these uh, electronic journal um, journals I publish.